Uh, hello, uh, my name is Jack Buth. I'm a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering here at Carnegie Mellon. I'm also director of the uh, Carnegie Mellon Next Manufacturing Center. I'll talk about that on uh, one slide. And I'm also a CEO of a startup company, Tolmaic Systems. And Tolmaic is developing a process mapping software, and I'll talk a bit about that. And if you're more, uh, if you're interested in some of these issues that I bring up, we have a series of uh, web pages here: my personal web page, my lab web page, and also the web page for the Next Manufacturing Center. So I wanted to talk about uh, additive manufacturing today, particularly the metal type processes, the direct metal processes. And uh, there are really two types of processes that are uh, of most interest to industry these days. They are the laser and electron beam powder fusion processes. And here you have an electron beam or a laser beam moving over a powder bed and locally fusing that powder. And if we can show the video, this is actually a video taken uh, in our laboratory. Okay, we just spread powder over the top of a part and you'll see a laser now tracing out the shape of a single layer uh, as it moves across the top of the part. And that laser is actually melting the metal powder, completely melting it, and then it is fusing to the layers below it. And uh, this is taken from uh, our EOS machine, uh, uh, the EOS model M290. And uh, you can see that it fills in the, uh, the shape of the, the, of, the, of the layer that's there. Uh, in what they call stripes. And so, in fact, that laser is moving across each stripe. It's not just a single bar of, of energy, but there's actually a laser that's rastering back and forth across the stripe as it moves along the stripe. And that last part was the, were the uh, contours on the inside and outside surfaces. Okay. Yeah, so currently what you're able to do with these types of processes is you can build uh, almost any three-dimensional shape. These processes, if you look at the way that, that the video looks, they seem to be very, very complicated. And the people who are using these processes look at them as being very complicated. But it ends up they can be understood and they can be manipulated and used like a manufacturing process. Yeah, I thought I'd show uh, just a few parts just to give you a sense of what can be made with these, these processes. Uh, the first two are engine brackets. This was from a, a General Electric competition they call it a GrabCAD challenge, where they take the standard design of a bracket, it's an external bracket for a jet engine, and they challenge people to come up with additive manufacturing versions of this part that could withstand the same loads uh, but exploited the capabilities of additive manufacturing. And this is fabricated out of a titanium alloy. Their second place winner was this design. That's the second, uh, second uh, uh, image on the slide there. And uh, you can see it looks sort of organic in, the, in, the, in its shape. And if you compare the weight of these two parts, the one exploiting additive manufacturing is about one-fifth of the standard bracket design. And that just gives you an example of how you can save a lot of weight by using additive manufacturing and only putting material where you need it. Uh, the second part is an exoskeleton component. This was with uh, uh, this is related to a project by Steve Collins. He's in our mechanical engineering department. He makes exoskeletons for rehabilitation applications. And what's interesting about this part is that it's designed to be very lightweight. It's still made out of titanium. But uh, all the arms here are just thin walls that are hollow on the inside. And he's using this to uh, advance some of his designs for exoskeletons. And the last part is a part we make for our undergraduate class. I call it the CMU mesh sphere. Uh, you can very easily embed cellular meshes into components by direct metal additive manufacturing. And uh, this is an example of that. And uh, the idea is that you can do this just as easily or even more easily than you can build a solid part. So to the extent that additive manufacturing is accepted uh, as a manufacturing process for metal parts, uh, you may see a lot of parts that are no longer solid. They will be these meshed cellular uh, uh, structures. Yeah, before I dig into my research, I want to make it clear that uh, I'm not the only person at Carnegie Mellon that's doing additive manufacturing. In fact, I used to be, uh, about four years ago, I used to be the only person doing metals additive manufacturing here. Uh, that's now changed. In fact, we have a CMU Next Manufacturing Center, which has over 20 faculty across the CMU campus doing additive manufacturing work. 
And we're really using uh, additive manufacturing as a test bed for developing new methods that can be used across a number of advanced manufacturing processes. And in the metal sphere, uh, you can see my, uh, my uh, image there uh, where we talk about AM process maps uh, uh, relating uh, process outcomes to the process variables that determine the uh, fusion process where you're fusing metal. But there are a lot of other issues associated with these processes. There's powder spreading. Fred Higgs is looking at that. Uh, there are a lot of materials issues, both at the powder scale and then also at the part microstructure scale. Chris Pistorius and Tony Rollett are looking at those issues. And then also uh, there are a lot of cost concerns. In fact, if you're considering adopting additive manufacturing in your company, uh, you're certainly going to be concerned about its cost benefits versus traditional manufacturing, for instance. Erica Fuchs is looking at those issues. And we're also looking at design issues. Uh, the, John Kagan is the person leading that, that effort. Uh, and just very briefly, we have equipment here. Uh, the main equipment I have in bold, uh, two RCAM electron beam direct metal uh, machines. Uh, those are fully upgraded with the multi-beam option. Also, I also mentioned the EOS Model 290 laser sintering machine. And again, the electron beam processes and the laser processes, those are the two that industry is most interested in, and those are the two that we have. And in fact, I want to point out the, the, the point at the very bottom of the slide. We are allowing external users to uh, have access to our equipment. So if you are concerned about you know, what are the real technical advantages or disadvantages of these processes, and you've already gotten a lot of information from the salespersons and the websites, uh, there's nothing like actually making a part on a machine. So we allow people to do that. So back to really sort of what is the state of the art for direct metal additive manufacturing. In fact, there's a whole lot of hype about what uh, additive manufacturing can do. And some of that hype is, is, is warranted, uh, although there's some realities also. Uh, it is true that right now you can get essentially 100% dense parts. Not completely 100% dense, but uh, very uh, few regions where you would have any kind of lack of fusion flaws. Minimum feature size is about 200 microns. You can push that a little bit on the laser-based processes. If you're talking about how big a parts you can build, you know, I showed these parts here. Uh, in plane dimensions, about uh, about 10 inches by 10 inches, uh, build heights maybe uh, 8 inches, and so even for this part, you could actually put multiple parts into that build volume. One downside is it can take a while to make these parts, uh, depending on the process and depending on how big the part is. You can go to as long as 24 hours, uh, maybe even longer than that, depending on the part. Uh, however, uh, it is definitely true that additive manufacturing is here and it's here to stay. Uh, I've got a picture of the, uh, of the uh, GE uh, jet engine nozzle, which they are now incorporating into a next generation, uh, they call it the LEAP engine at GE. And uh, they will be making tens of thousands of those per year within the next year. Now, one issue is the current processes, electron beam powder bed, laser powder bed, and other competing processes that aren't quite as popular, they have been developed to allow you to basically build shapes. That's how the process variables were worked out originally, experimentally. However, there are a lot of other process outcomes you're going to want to control if you're a mechanical engineer and you're trying to use this as a manufacturing process. So that's really where our research comes in. And what we do is we call it process mapping. And we map out process outcomes, not just building a shape, but things like surface finish, microstructure, control of porosity. And you map them out in terms of primary process variables. And I have them listed here, beam power, beam travel speed, those are the major ones, layer thickness, the background temperature, the local geometry that you're depositing. And what we are doing is showing customers, people who actually have these machines, how they can manipulate the process to come up with their own recipes uh, for how to, how to build parts. And uh, what we do is we step through a series of simulations or experiments with different geometries. And that's a major point. Originally, we were process modelers exclusively, and we used process mapping to represent our results from process models. But now we're actually doing more experimental work where we have, are identifying, and we're doing this through our software, uh, identifying minimum numbers of experiments to run to characterize a machine or characterize a process. <clears throat> yeah, in fact, I'd like to show this. Uh, the, the y-axis here is beam power, and the, the x-axis is beam travel speed or velocity. And this is where some of the existing direct metal processes reside in what we call P2 
PV space. And uh, the green is the electron beam powder bed process. And that really thin orange uh, piece, uh, rectangle at the very bottom, those are the laser powder bed processes. And there are a couple of competing uh, processes off to the left on that chart. And uh, you can ask yourself, why are they where they are? It just ends up that's sort of where they started, and that's where they are currently. And so we're one of the few groups that's looking at uh, where the processes should be in process space, not just where they are. And again, we have a company, Tolmaic Systems, that's developing software to uh, map out uh, uh, any one process or any one machine. And the idea here is that these machines and the investment into additive manufacturing is very expensive. It's substantial. Just the machines are $600,000 to $1 million each. You've got $40,000 a year per machine on maintenance, plus you have to train somebody, plus you have to provide the facilities. And what we're trying to do is show people how to get the most out of that investment uh, in machines. Uh, just to give you a sense of, uh, of how this can impact industry, I give one example here for aerospace. In the aerospace industry, and particularly if you're thinking about that fuel nozzle from GE, in fact, they're one of our major collaborators, uh, if you think of what it took to go from the concept of making a fuel nozzle for by additive manufacturing to actually having it qualified uh, to be made that way, it took about four years, and it took millions of dollars, and lots of testing. And in fact, what I have on the slide here is I call it trial and error experiments. I would say intuitively, uh, intuitively guided trial and error experiments. A lot of experimenting, trying to change the process to get the outcomes that you want. Whereas what we're doing with process mapping is we're identifying key process variables. We map out the process in a methodical way, and we show how to get the different process outcomes. And if you change the process to affect one outcome, what that does to the other outcomes. And we've got uh, quite a few fundamental and uh, tech transfer supported research projects that are supporting this effort. Now, you might say, well, I'm not in the aerospace industry, so I don't need to you know, be, be concerned about additive manufacturing. Uh, that's no longer true. I would say that's that was maybe true a couple of years ago. Uh, now, when we talk to companies, I would say every company that's making metal components is now at least interested in learning about direct metal additive. Uh, and is considering adopting it. So in fact, we talked to a lot of companies that, uh, that are really looking closely at direct metal additive manufacturing. And one of the first things you try to do is identify which components that you may produce across multiple divisions, you know, which components would be good uh, candidates for being made by additive. And so we can do that. We can help you, uh, we can help you identify those. Uh, it's also true, the disappointing part is you can spend, you know, a million or two million dollars investing in an additive machine and be expecting to be making parts within a week or two. And that's not true. It typically, typically takes uh, six months or even 12 months to really learn how to use a machine, even with training. And so we're trying to collapse that time for people. Uh, and then ultimately, you want to be able to manipulate or change the process. Uh, you want to have your own recipes for how to make a certain component that your competitor does not have, and that's what we help people to do. And again, our, our research is sort of impacting all of these, whether you're just considering additive manufacturing or you just bought a machine or you're sort of a, a, an expert or you're all the way to where the air, some of the aerospace companies are and they're really trying to dig into the specifics of the process. <clears throat> So I've just got three slides now just to give you a sense of what we can do uh, uh, research-wise. Uh, the first is, you know, uh, we talk about sort of balancing some of these process out, uh, outcomes. And uh, this is an example of if you want to balance build rate, you want to build things as fast as possible, versus how precisely you can build that part. You want to be able to build fine features, for instance. And so this is a, uh, a PV process map, beam power versus travel speed. Uh, where uh, we've mapped out melt pool dimensions. In fact, those straight lines moving from lower left to upper right, uh, those are curves of constant melt pool size. And if you go through the research, uh, by and large, if you want to increase build rate, you basically want to just increase power. The more power you have going into the part, the, the, the faster you can melt material and the faster you can build things. On the other hand, precision scales with the size of the melt pool. If your melt pool is bigger, you're not going to be as precise in, in, in controlling the dimensions. And so actually increasing precision sends you to the lower right-hand corner of this plot. 
And so you have sort of competing types of uh, interests here. But what you can do, we can show this, is that if you stay on one of these lines, then your process precision is the same. And then if you go up in power along one of these lines, you're able to maintain your precision while you increase build rate. And that's the type of intuition we're trying to build into what we do. Another issue is microstructure. In fact, a key issue with additive manufacturing, which you've not been able to do before, is you have the opportunity now to specify microstructure, which means specifying material properties at every location in a part when it's being built up. That's the promise, but the reality is nobody really knows how to do that except us. Okay, and we're we're still developing our techniques, but we have uh, started to crack the code with respect to how to control the size of microstructural features as a function of process variables, still keeping in mind how you're changing other outcomes. And so I've got some micrographs here. These are, uh, these are uh, uh, from uh, transmission electron microscopy images of what are grains in the metals. And what you need to pull away from this is we start out with a grain width of 91 microns. We're able to prescribe the process variable, so we essentially double that and we're able to prescribe them, so we essentially triple those sizes. And with respect to controlling mechanical properties, that's essential, very important. And the last issue is we have a pretty major project on powders that are being used in additive manufacturing. And in fact, uh, I'll tell you this, if you're going to buy a direct metal machine, a powder bed machine, you have to become also an expert on the powders that go into the machine. And the current state of the art is that if you buy one of these machines, you're supposed to buy your powders from the machine manufacturer in order to get the quality of parts that they guarantee. And anybody that's trying to actually build a part or, or actually use this as a manufacturing process can't put up with that. You can't just have one supplier. And uh, you want to be able to have, a, have, have some uh, uh, choices in how and what types of powders you can put into your machine. So in fact, what we're doing is uh, allowing actually much larger diameter powders to be used in these machines than they currently are being used. And in fact, that's a big issue because the way powders are, are obtained is there's a powder lot that's, that's fabricated. They typically have powder diameters ranging from five to about 500 microns. And the way you get the additive powders is you screen out all those large particle diameters. And uh, so that means there's one powder run, and you're only using, say, 10 to 15, maybe 20% of that run in your additive machine. And the rest of the powder is hopefully recycled, or it may be scrapped. And what that means is the, the additive powders are very expensive right now. And we're trying to give users options on what kind of powders to use in order to cut down cost. So I don't know, just sort of sum up, uh, if you haven't really been keeping up with additive manufacturing, you really need to. What's happened over the past four years has been really quite remarkable. You've gone from really just the promise of being able to build three-dimensional parts out of metals to being able to do that, and then now to actually have parts that are being uh, uh, in the aerospace industry that are set for production right now. Uh, what we're doing is we're trying to map out process outcomes in terms of process variables. And uh, that can plug into, again, for the aerospace industry, process qualification methods, shrinking those times and costs to qualify a process to make a part. But on the other end, uh, we can give advice, technical advice, in-depth technical advice to people that are considering adopting direct metal additive manufacturing or who are just getting started. And just to reemphasize, it's not just me at Carnegie Mellon that's doing direct metal additive manufacturing. I'm, uh, I'm leading the charge. Uh, but we have, again, uh, more than 20 faculty members that are doing something in additive manufacturing and quite a few that are working directly on the metals processes. Okay, thank you. Very nice.